The problem that we live in is that the average individual is eating the wrong foods and eating them so frequently that their body is flush with insulin all the time. It's actually been, I think, 20 years now when the concept of insulin resistance was, was proposed. I know Gerald Reardon was a big uh, proponent of this about 20 years ago. Uh, the concept of insulin resistance is a culprit in, in our, you know, our heart, our health issues. So I thought we could do a deep dive into the subject and give kind of a refresher course to the audience because I've, uh, I've been writing about this for a long time and I tend to forget, like you say in your book, that most people haven't even heard of this, even though it's, it's been around. So why, when it comes to insulin, most people think about insulin as a medication for people with diabetes. And so let's start off by defining insulin and how it works in the body. Go ahead, take it away. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Right. In fact, it's funny. You mentioned how most people aren't familiar with this. That's why I, I didn't name the book Insulin Resistance, Why You Should Care, because I knew no one would. They would only read it if they thought they had diabetes. Yeah, so this is the most common problem, and it all starts with that humble little hormone, insulin, and it is very little on the grand scale of hormones and how and what their sizes are. But insulin has an effect at literally every single cell of the body. Now, I don't use the word literally too liberally like the kids do these days. Literally every cell will respond to insulin, whether from, from brain cells to bone cells or, or lung cells to liver cells. Insulin will come to a cell, knock on a door, if you will, that's specifically designed for insulin, and then tell the cell to do something. And it does a lot of things, of course, because it does things differently at different cells. But insulin's most famous effect, and I'm not saying it's most important, but its most famous effect is to control blood sugar or blood glucose levels. And that's why people typically only think of insulin as being relevant to, say, diabetes, which is, you know, they look at diabetes as a disease of glucose. Now, I have my own issues with that definition, but nevertheless, that's its most famous effect and that's how people see it. The problem that we live in is that the average individual is eating the wrong foods and eating them so frequently that their body is flush with insulin all the time. And right by the time in the morning, overnight, that insulin's starting to come down, what do they do? They immediately bump it right back up for the next 20 or so hours. So we're living in a state of chronically elevated insulin. And this is, I would say, the primary driver of insulin not working as well as it used to. And, and as you noted, this is the most common problem potentially affecting up to 88% of U.S. adults, what we call the metabolic syndrome, what used to be called the insulin resistance syndrome, is the most common disorder that we deal with. Yeah, um, you made a good point. I, I tell my patients that insulin literally is a salesperson that knocks on the door and says, you know, hey, you know, I want to sell you something. And uh, as I tell my patients right now, um, the the home is full that they're not interested in buying what insulin is selling anymore. And they're resistant to the sales pitch that insulin is making. Where do you, besides the fact that, you know, we eat 20 hours a day almost constantly, why why is this happen? Why is this uh, a modern disease? Yeah, yes, this is this is the modern disease and in my mind it's the that's certainly the case I make is that insulin resistance is the foundation of all of the so-called plagues of prosperity. These diseases that our ancestors never heard of um, that are just eliminating and wiping us out. They are diseases of lifestyle and it is absolutely the food we eat and the frequency with which we eat it. Now, unfortunately, to make matters even worse, so much of what we do is at the behest or the encouragement of people who we trust. 
we've been told that we should avoid fat um, and we've been told that we should eat just low fat foods and we should eat six times a day. And I look at that as a, as a metabolic scientist uh, and I think, boy, that is a perfect recipe uh, to create a perfect metabolic storm of ensuring that insulin is chronically elevated and then every chronic disease will start to follow to, in, in some order. How do we get this so wrong? You're right. Everybody has been told, uh, uh, you know, eat six small meals a day. You got to, you know, you got to keep your metabolism revving. You can't mm -hmm. have a, a fall in your blood sugar. That'll, you know, sap you of energy. Uh, how did, how, I mean, where did we go wrong? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's certainly a lot of myths that need to be busted, and you've noted some of the biggest ones. I believe the origins of this all started with the anti-fat crusades of the 1950s and 60s, which was built on this idea that eating saturated fat will cause heart disease. And then in short order, that became a concern of eating fat in general is going to make you fat. That was not the prevailing paradigm at the time. What we take as a, the gospel of, of metabolism nowadays, which it's just accepted as dogma, uh, was absolutely not accepted broadly um, in the earlier part of the 1900s. Um, this really came to life in the mid-1900s, and of course it's only grown and it was institutionalized, which is where I think it really became a problem. Um, I don't mean to be perceived as an individual who is opposed to political power, but it, it, it's just particularly tragic that, in, as far as I know, um, with the issuance of the initial um, dietary guidelines in the U.S., that became the first time that a, that, a, that a government told its people what to eat. And wouldn't you know, um, th they got it all wrong, uh, in my mind. They, that, that, that food guy, the pyramid, ought to have been flipped, or at least ought to have been more balanced and uh, not vilified fat. I'm a great defender of fat, and, and I know that's something you and I are uh, aligned with. Uh, but that, that idea then started getting mingled with other ideas, like you need to eat to keep up your metabolism. What a, what a remarkably uh, amusing statement. Um, one of the realities of, of fasting is that on a short order fast, 24 to 36 hours, metabolic rate actually increases. Most people don't appreciate this due to, but, but uh, and, and in contrast, eating frequently where you're bumping up your insulin, we just published a paper looking at how insulin slows down metabolic rate in fat cells. We published that last year from human fat samples. We took fat biopsies from humans. Uh, so the whole idea of, of how we look at food and how we need to be eating all these calories to accelerate our metabolic rate, while there is there has always been an ounce of truth to some of those ideas, it has increasingly ignored the fact that at the end of the day, it's not calories that dictate metabolic health, it's hormones. Because on its own, a cell doesn't know what to do with the energy that it has around it. Hormones tell the cell what to do. Case in point, and then I'll and I'll be done. Right across the hallway here on campus is my is my lab, the Metabolism Research Lab, and we grow fat cells in little petri dishes. These little pe these little fat cells are swimming in a sea of calories. They have abundant fats, abundant glucose, all of which a fat cell is eager to take in and turn it into storage fat, stored fat, but it can't do it until we start sprinkling in the insulin. Insulin, and, and I'm not saying calories don't matter. Energy matters, of course it does. But hormones tell a cell, especially a fat cell, what to do with the energy that it has. With your metaphor of the salesperson, insulin will knock on the door and what it's attempting to sell to every cell of the body is this message of, I have something here for you to store and don't let it go. Take it into the house of the cell and store it and hoard it and hoard it. Don't break it down. Don't give it away. Now, as you noted, some cells stop responding to that with numerous consequences, but some cells don't. They Some cells continue to be responsive to that sales message that insulin is trying to pitch. And you, you, you mentioned a very important point there that I want everybody to realize, and I, I spend a lot of time in my more recent books trying to make this point. When you, well, let's assume that elevated insulin is bad, and we'll get into why that's bad. But 
one of the consequences of having a high insulin level, you're right, insulin is trying to get fat cells, take this stuff, you know, store it as fat, but you said, and don't release it. And one of the, I think, most important concepts for people who or oh, trying a ketogenic diet or trying even fasting is that most Americans, most Westerners are metabolically inflexible and they have such high insulin levels that insulin prevents the fat cell from releasing the fat. Uh, you know, it, it blocks hormone sensitive lipase to get yep. uh, and And without hormone sensitive lipase, you can't l release that fat. So it's, I mean, it's a really damned if you do and damned if you don't uh, with insulin. Um, and so many people just kind of fall flat on their face when they attempt time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. Can you get into that? I, th well, yeah. I think that's a really important part of what you mentioned in your book. Yeah, right. Well, I very much appreciate you bringing this up. And from what I the way I'm looking at what you're describing, you're touching on this idea of, uh, well, the relevance of the fat cell, which is enormous, and then how to how the fat cell kind of gets it wrong or gets it right for improving metabolic health. Um, what The fat cell is one of the cells that my lab studies uh, most heavily uh, in recent years. We're sort of split between the fat cell projects and neuron projects with regards to the brain um, and brain metabolism. But with the fat cell, the, the mistake that many people will make is assuming that, well, one, we assume fat is bad, which is just not true. We are designed to have fat on the organ, on the body, and we need it. The absence of fat completely is utterly catastrophic um, to, the, to the species. There's no fertility, for example. There's no reproduction without fat mass on the body, just as an example um, of, of one of many consequences. But, of course, too much is a problem, and that's the problem that we have nowadays but it's not a problem of mass the mass of fat we have isn't important what is important is the size of the fat cells themselves so if you could imagine two individuals that each is gaining weight and they they meet up again as college roommates 20 years later and they've both gained 50 pounds which is not too hard to believe at all no. but one fellow is he has normal blood pressure he doesn't have any migraine headaches he has normal fertility but even though he's gained the same 50 pounds the other guy has migraines he has fatty liver disease he has erectile dysfunction hypertension but they have the same amount of fat but one fellow has gained his fat through a process called hyperplasia which is when the fat cells are multiplying to store more fat and to respond to insulin's storage signal but they never get very big the moment a fat cell starts to get big we simply recruit a new fat cell and so while there are a lot of fat cells they're all metabolically sound and, ha and happy and healthy on the other hand we have the individual and this is where the vast majority of people fall most people are this fellow where the number of fat cells they have is set this is typical. After puberty, when we've gone through adolescence and we're adults, whatever number of fat cells we have is done. And, and thereafter, any growth of fat mass is due to hypertrophy. Each individual fat cell starts to get very, very big. That is the fat cell that becomes very insulin resistant because it gets so big and it can get 10 times the size of the other fat cells. It has to start to tell insulin, insulin, you are continuing to force me to take in what you're selling and you're not allowing me to let it go, but too bad. I have to start letting it go. And so it starts leaking these free fatty acids that will get stored elsewhere in the body where the body shouldn't be storing fat, like muscle and the liver especially. But at the same time, the hypertrophic fat cell gets very inflamed. It starts releasing a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, all in an effort to try to survive. It actually is doing so to try to increase blood flow to itself. It's starting to run out of blood. As it gets so big, it can't get enough blood. But unfortunately, while the hypertrophic or really fat fat cell is doing these two things in order to ensure its own survival, it's starting to damage the rest of the body. But then to kind of bring it back to what you mentioned as I quickly wrap up, 
Most people would say immediately, well, I'm going to shrink my fat cells, even if they don't say it that way. They'll think I'm going to lose weight. And I would say, you want to shrink your fat cells. I'm going to do it by cutting energy and I'm going to go fast really quickly and immediately. <clears throat> but that's not the best way in my mind to shrink a fat cell. Because if someone, as you noted, is has metabolic inflexibility and they kind of have chronically elevated insulin, if they just jump into a fast, they're going to be stuck in sugar burning mode because fat, uh, insulin determines sugar burning mode and turns off fat burning mode because of what you noted with the change in lipase activity at fat cells, you literally can't access your own stored fat. So the person's glucose starts to come down and they start to get really hungry and more and more hunger climbs and then hunger wins and then they break and they end up binging and going back to old habits. So in my mind, while energy matters to shrink fat cells, don't start with that. Start with cutting back insulin. And when you start drop cutting back your insulin through dietary changes, then you can allow the fat cell to shrink as you start using your own fat. Then later you transition into some degree of fasting where now you're scrutinizing energy a little more. So the answer is uh, for years, uh, well-meaning physicians, since insulin seems to be the cure, quote, for type 2 diabetes, uh, that we should give our type 2 diabetes more insulin, yeah. which uh, which will just you know that, that that's fine. We'll just you know pound the the cells with more and more insulin. And it, as you know and I know, we've we've seen people gain 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds once they're put on insulin. Uh, how did we get that so yeah. long? Yeah, oh, I love that you're bringing this up um, because it touches on what I believe is a fundamental misunderstanding of type 2 diabetes and even type 1. So, so just a very, very quick background. Diabetes means a lot of urine production, you know, just f for everyone listening. And, and that's what, what type 1 and type 2 have in common is that they can get high glucose levels. And when glucose goes too high, it starts spilling into the, into the urine, making a lot of urine. That's where the term diabetes comes from. But unfortunately, because they both have that in common, we look, we've diagnosed or determined both of these diseases based on glucose problem. Um, it's a blood sugar problem. To me, it is not. To me, it's an insulin problem. And if we look at type 1 and type 2 diabetes as insulin problems, then they're exact opposites. Because while type 1 diabetes is a disease of no insulin, type 2 is a disease of too much as, I, as we've kind of been discussing, there's too much insulin and the body starts to become resistant to it. And so now when insulin's coming to the muscle cells, which is the main consumer of blood glucose, and it's trying to sell the glucose to the muscle, the muscle says, I'm not buying it. And so the glucose stays in the blood and keeps climbing, and then we call it type 2 diabetes. So I believe that the whole problem is that we have a glucose-centric paradigm of type 2 diabetes when we should have an insulin-centric paradigm because it's the high insulin and the insulin resistance that's killing the person. That's what's causing the heart disease and the, and the increased Alzheimer's risk and the hypertension and the fatty liver disease. It's not the glucose being high. It's the high insulin. And if we look at this through the lens of insulin, then we can see just how catastrophic it is to give a type 2 diabetic more insulin. It's the high insulin that caused it. It's as if we are trying to cure someone's alcoholism by giving them another glass of wine. We're giving them more of the very thing that caused the problem. Uh, you know, I'm reminded, and I wrote about this in one of my early books, uh, the, uh, the New York... Um, public health department was uh, tracked uh, diabetes beginning actually in the 1920s. And every year, uh, diabetes really wasn't even known until, the, you know, after the turn of the last century. And what they found surprised people because we've been told that say blacks and hispanics have a very high risk of developing diabetes that it's part of you know their genetic makeup and yet when in new york city they found that in fact when they started tracking this 
diabetics and Hispanics had virtually no diabetes, and the people who had diabetes were the bankers and the merchants, and they were the ones who were not working. They were, you know, desk jobs. And the blacks and Hispanics were workers. And it gets back to your point that the workers, the muscles, were hungry and you know, happy to take in what insulin was selling. But the merchants and the bankers, their muscles weren't hungry. And we should have realized way back then that we, you know, we had this kind of all backwards, that the, the family history, oh, well, blacks are predisposed to this. No, that's not it at all. It's whether the muscles are willing to, you know, are hungry. Yep. Yeah. Well said. I couldn't agree more. That's a great metaphor again. Yeah. We, and that's why, that's why exercise and moving the muscle is such an immediate benefit. Um, uh, exercise is antithetical to high insulin. The moment the muscles start moving, most people don't appreciate this while muscle does need insulin to open up those glucose doors and bring it in. It only needs it when it's not exercising. When the, the moment the muscle starts contracting, it's dynamic, it becomes so hungry for energy, it opens those glucose doors on its own. It, do, it no longer needs insulin. This is one of the many reasons I'm such an advocate of exercise, and indeed, any exercise. The best exercise is the one a person will do. Is just get up and move those muscles, and it will force those glucose doors open, thereby lowering blood glucose thereby lowering insulin, helping the body be a little better with insulin. So um, I think this is very important for anybody listening who says, well, you know, I, exercise is difficult for me because, you know, I'm carrying a lot of weight and it hurts me to exercise and I don't like to exercise. Uh, and how do, we, how do you break this cycle? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What it, well, I think it's very important for people to adhere to the simple, even silly maxim, which is the best exercise is the one you'll do. If it is, if it is just get up and go walking, you know, one of my um, one of the activities my wife and I enjoy doing here in the mountains in the winter is cross country skiing. It's it's crazy. It's it's a challenge. Um, but boy, minute for minute, oh my gosh, you are really going to work your body. And if I said in in this podcast, if I said everyone should go cross-country skiing. Or even crazier, if I said everyone should go do CrossFit. No, almost every single person listening would just say, well, I, I'm not going to go CrossFit or I'm not, I can't cross-country ski, so I'll just do nothing. So don't worry about that. Just do anything. The moment, even if it's just taking a walk or, or doing some air squats or just being up and busy and roaming around the house, just get up and move. And it, particularly... Get up and move when you've eaten whatever the, uh, a starchy or sugary intake might have been. And, and if you just get up and move, you can lower that glycemic load and insulin spike by up to 50% just by getting up and doing something for about 15 minutes. Uh, because you just, you basically recruit the muscle. You say, muscle, I got a big load of sugar coming or you know, whatever it may be, a big load of glucose. I need you to take it in so that my body doesn't have to really bear this metabolic burden. You know, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, in in Europe, particularly in in France and Italy, and one of the thing and Spain. And one of the things that's really interesting is that so many of these cultures have a habit of strolling after dinner, uh, almost you know, it's strolling, you know, walking, not not exercising, but it, it's ingrained in these cultures and. Years ago, I found a paper uh, that looked at people, they were asked to walk for 10 minutes before the meal versus walking 10 minutes after the meal. And they looked at actually weight gain. And it turns out, just like you said, the people who, and they ate the same calories, the people who walked after the meal actually lost weight. And the people who walked before the meal uh, didn't lose weight. And I think it gets down to exactly what you're saying. Um, and it's those little things uh, that, that can make a big difference when we're trying to turn this around. Yeah, yeah. By, by, get up and get, by getting up and doing something, you basically, the body is saying, hey, all the energy that just came in, 
you don't get to go to the fat cells. I need you to go to the muscle because the muscle is demanding it. It's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil here. So go to the muscle cells instead of the fat cells. But if you haven't coupled it with some movement, well, then insulin will go up and insulin will just store it where it wants, including fat cells. That's why as people uh, who follow me, I actually write prescriptions for people to get a dog and uh, dogs make make you uh, move uh, whether you want to or not and whether it's uh, 20 degrees in Provo, yeah. Utah, uh, yeah. The, the dog says, I don't care. Come on, you know, we're, we're in, going. In fact, case in point, that was me at 530 this morning, literally. You and me both, actually. <laughs> the, the, the dog said, come on, I know yeah. it's dark outside. Grab a flashlight. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's amazing. I, I have so many of my patients uh, say that this was the only prescription that a doctor ever wrote that, you know, was useful. And some of them bring in their, their, their prescription framed and, and they'll actually bring in the dog and say, you know, here, here, here's your prescription, you know, thank you. But, but you're right, these are, and these are, they seem inconsequential, but, uh, and I think, let's shift gears, okay. Most of us in, in this, including you, know that an elevated insulin is really behind so much of what's going to happen to us. And let's, let's talk about the brain and insulin. Uh, when I was in training, you know, back in the dark ages, uh, we thought that somehow the brain was privileged and that, it, that insulin had nothing to do with the brain and sugar. And how, number one, how did we get that wrong? And number two, where is, why is insulin so important and in insulin resistance in brain health and brain deterioration? Yeah, so I can speak to this with a, a fairly high degree of authority. We've just published two papers within the last year and one more in review right now on this very topic. Uh, so the part of the brain that we now all of the brain is important, of course. It's the hippocampus that we're primarily interested in and what we've been studying because that's the part of the brain that becomes compromised with cognition and memory. In other words, Alzheimer's disease or classic dementia. We know now that the brain is able to, well, multiple things we know. Um, one is that the brain is a hybrid in that it is at any moment relying on both blood sugar or, or glucose and ketones. Ketones are the other primary fuel for the brain. Second, we know that the brain has, uh, much of the brain's glucose is dependent on those doors that insulin comes and knocks on. This was something we did not know even 20 years ago. Yeah. This, uh, where, the, where a portion of the doors that allow glucose to come in need insulin to come and knock on them first. And if insulin isn't able, if the, if the knock doesn't get heard, those doors don't open. And so what we've similarly discovered in the ensuing years is that many of the uh, neurological diseases that we look at as distinct have one thing in common. And I'll back up briefly, then come back forward. If we look at epilepsy and migraines and Alzheimer's disease and depression, we would say they have nothing in common. And indeed, they have a lot that is very, very distinct. But in every one of those brain disorders or neurological problems, every one of them has a confirmed phenomenon known as brain glucose hypometabolism. In every one of those disorders, we've been able to measure, not me in my lab, but other scientists, we've been able to confirm that the brain isn't getting an optimal amount of energy. It, it can't get glucose in very well. And that is very, very likely because the brain becomes insulin resistant. That's absolutely the case in Alzheimer's disease. And so there are two interventions here. One is to say, all right, I'm going to improve my insulin sensitivity. And this is why insulin resistance in particular is so predictive of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, a study published in Finland, what was called the prospective study, where they looked at people that went back in time of people who had Alzheimer's disease or didn't, and they found that someone's markers of insulin resistance ended up being more predictive of developing Alzheimer's disease than their age. 
I mean, it was it, what a mind-boggling concept, and, and it certainly added a little cement to this growing foundation that this is a metabolic problem. So on one hand, again, it would be this effort to improve insulin sensitivity and allow the insulin to come and knock on those glucose doors and then open in return and then allow the glucose to come in and feed the brain. And that is important. It's important to note that the brain is part of this trinity of very high metabolic rate organs. You know, by mass, the brain has one of the highest metabolic rates in the body at any moment, including sleep. And so it's constantly demanding energy. And importantly, unlike other cells, like muscle cells, the brain can't store its own energy. You know, muscle has a little reserve of glucose and a reserve of fat. The brain has no such reserve. It has to constantly be getting its energy from the blood. And so if it can't get blood sugar... Of course, it starts to go hungry, then the person has migraines, or they have depression, or they have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. Now, in addition to improving the insulin sensitivity, a person could give the brain a break and let it eat ketones from time to time. The brain is desperate for ketones. And people, one of the myths that I was certainly taught was that the brain <clears throat> prefers glucose. People will say that, that they will say that glucose is the brain's preferred fuel, or they might not even say preferred and just say it's its only fuel. That is categorically false. We know that even the moment ketone levels start to climb in the blood, even if the ketones are only a fifth or a, a third, let alone a half of what glucose is, the brain has already shifted to be getting more than twice the amount of its energy from ketones compared to glucose. And this is even in a healthy person where the insulin's working. So if the brain prefers any fuel, in my mind, it clearly prefers the ketones because the moment the ketones start to climb, the brain immediately starts pulling them in. And that is something we studied. We actually had brain tissue, hippocampal tissue from human donors who had died with Alzheimer's disease and without. And it was the glucose pathways. It was the glucose biochemistry that was compromised at every step, not the ketones. So when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, certainly there is this inability to get its energy from glucose. So all the more reason to give the brain a break and let it have some ketones. And you've kind of filled that gap. You know, we have that in the U. I just was in London giving a talk a couple weeks ago. Mind the gap, they say, as I'm going into the tube. Well, yep. we got to mind the energetic gap. We need to fill that gap. The brain's energy demand is right here. Glucose can only feed it up to here. Well, ketones can fill the rest. All right. So how do we do that? Uh, that's the $64,000 question, because um, I, I've my last book, Unlocking the Keto Code, uh, gives my uh, impressions on how to do this. But I want to hear it from you since you're researching this. And you and I both agree that you, we've got to give the brain some ketones. Yeah. Most people most people can't give the brain ketones because of the insulin resistance. Yep. That, in fact, that indeed, that touches on just the scope of the problem because the average individual nowadays who is insulin resistant, not only is the brain crying out for the glucose that it can't get, but because they're insulin resistant and they have high insulin levels, they can't make any ketones. So the fuel... It can't, it, it's swimming in a sea of one of the fuels and it can't get enough of it. And the other one that it can pull in isn't even there to help it anyway. So, yeah, in my mind, we have to address the insulin. Um, and this touches on the fundamental biochemistry uh, of, of metabolism and ketone metabolism. Certainly, ketones are products of fat burning. When the body is burning a lot of fat, it starts to essentially burn more fat than it needs for its own energetic demand, especially this is in the liver. When insulin is low, the liver starts burning more and more fat. And a lot of that energy in the fat burning will feed the liver cells. The liver will use that energy. But eventually, if insulin stays low, the liver can't stop burning fat. And the fat cells can't stop giving fat to the liver to burn. So the liver just keeps burning more and more fat to the point that even after it's met its own needs, it keeps going and that excess, if you will, is start what's is start is what becomes ketones. 
It's basically the liver's way of saying to the body, hey body, I can't stop burning fat, but I don't need it, so I'm going to share these ketones with you, and now you guys use it. And so the brain starts burning the ketones. Fat cells start burning the ketones, which is work we've published, and, and how the ketones actually accelerate metabolic rate in the fat cells. Muscles burn ketones. Every cell with mitochondria, which is practically every cell of the body, will gladly use ketones for fuel. And so, again, to kind of bring it back to the question, the key is lowering insulin, whether it is by managing your macronutrients or whether it is by time-restricted eating or in, in intermittent fasting. The moment insulin starts to come down, ketones will start to go up because the body has shifted to fat burning and if insulin, keeps, if insulin stays low for about 16 to 20 hours, the body has been burning so much fat that it, it almost, it, it in a way is burning more fat than it knows what to do with, and then starts to become the ketones. And um, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, free fatty acids are very difficult to get into the brain. They're too big to get past the blood-brain barrier. But the brilliance of the design, as far as I can tell, is that ketones are very small uh, fat uh, bodies that easily uh, penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Yep, that's, I agree completely. It's interesting to note the metabolism of the brain. Where the brain doesn't burn fat, it uses fat for structure. The brain itself is a very fatty you know, yeah. kind of, there's a lot of lipids, there's a lot of fats in the brain. It doesn't burn the fat, it uses the fat for structure, and instead, as you note, relies on these products of fat burning, namely the ketones. Yeah, and in fact, it is interesting. Neurons are perfectly capable of actually burning free fatty acids in their mitochondria, but they just can't get in um, through the blood-brain barrier normally. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we're, we're talking or dancing around the essential problem that we started talking about, and that is our, our current diet is the perfect storm for insulin resistance. Uh, and so what's the perfect solution? Number one, you've already said it, make muscles hungry. Um, and however we can do that, you're right. It is, it is, whatever you'll do and do consistently is, is the correct answer. Um, what else can we do? Yeah, right. Yeah, so the, to me, it is all about managing macronutrients. So we've already touched on exercise, uh, and we've mentioned intermittent fasting, so I won't mention those again. Um, but at the same time, as important those, as those are, to me, they are supplemental because if we aren't f managing our macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, then those are going to have a limited benefit, particularly with regards to intermittent fasting. As much as I'm an advocate of it, I'm always quick to say how an individual ends a fast is more important than how long they fast. And I think too many people fall into that trap of just shrugging their shoulders and saying, I'm going to fast for 24 hours, getting hungrier and hungrier and hungrier with no plan, and then they binge, and then they just do the whole thing again the next day. So to me, the key is lowering insulin, and that is best achieved with three, I believe, hopefully to remember, rules. The first one is control carbohydrates. And that doesn't mean we don't eat any carbohydrates, but we just appreciate the fact that carbohydrates that come in a bag or a box with a barcode are going to be carbohydrates that are going to spike blood sugar, which is going to spike insulin. The amount of starch and sugar uh, compared to the amount of any kind of soluble fiber is going to be so problematic that it's just going to be a rush of glucose. So control carbohydrates. Uh, that would be, in my mind, the first rule. And then rules two and three kind of come together because in nature they do. But the next one is prioritize protein. In my mind, getting adequate protein, which really promotes a sense of satiety. Um, and don't be afraid of fat. Don't fear fat. Generally, by that I mean, in nature, protein comes with fat. There's no exception to that. In nature, all of the best proteins that exist in nature that humans would have been eating since time immemorial come with fat. That's how we should get it. Don't try to cut that fat out. Um, when, when we just eat pure protein, we don't digest it as well. Most people don't appreciate the fact that bile, which is typically only thought of as being involved in fat digestion, actually enhances 
protein digestion and fat and protein together are more anabolic to muscle growth than just protein is. That's how we should get it. So control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, don't fear fat. So what is, um, is there a, rather than eating six small meals a day, um, is there, and, and you, you and I, I think are both uh, pro- obviously proponents of intermittent fasting done correctly. Uh, is there any recommendations or your research that says, well, yeah, okay, I, I love your description. If it comes in a bag or a box and it's got a barcode, uh, probably that's not what you want to eat. I'll, I'll even go farther. The idea that uh, I want a protein drink or a protein shake that's got uh, protein isolates uh, where everything has been broken down already t- strikes me as equally as big a problem. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to, yeah, so we need to be careful when it comes to a food being processed, um, no doubt. And uh, not that it can't be done well, it, it can, but it has to be smart. Uh, and I do think there's something to be said for foods that are, are convenient, but allow an individual to adhere to their their rules. You know, if someone were to say, all right, Ben, I'm going to do control carbs, prioritize prioritize protein, don't fear fat, but how do I do it? Well, the best way we would both agree is eating real food and planning meals, but it is difficult to plan and prepare perfectly packaged meals. And and so there's something to be said for the convenience of of meals and, and, and something that's ready to go. But you certainly need to be smart about what you pick because the easy way, as you note, the easy thing for a manufacturer to do is to just pick um, the ch- uh, pure dextrose as a filler and it's pure glucose. They're going to pick the cheapest um, fats or oils and it's going to be sunflower oil or it's going to be soybean oil and they're going to pick the cheapest proteins and that's going to be i don't know pea protein or pea something protein, yeah. yeah and they're going to pick which is you and i both know is deeply problematic in large part in, in, for many reasons not to mention the compromised amino acid absorption and the anti-nutrients that are there that people think they're doing their body such a favor with by eating so that's the problem is that the manufacturer is too tempted to pick the cheapest version and then the macronutrient ratio might look good but those are macronutrients that you just don't want yeah that's that's very well said um you're right Um, manufacturers unfortunately um because of price constraints and profit margin will usually always find the cheapest available ingredient that that sounds good when you look at the macronutrients and yet each one of them is is a health bomb in in so many ways i have an audience question that i answer but i'm going to ask you to answer this one before i come in because it's exactly uh what we've been talking about are you ready i am okay uh the user is at hannah lee I need to do intermittent fasting for health benefits, but I do not need to lose weight. I am already too thin. Do you have any advice for me to do intermittent fasting while not losing weight, please? Thank you. That's a great question. It is. Um, I I don't want to answer a question with a question, but I, I just can't help but start it. I would say why what would be the benefit to intermittent fasting? But let's just, let's say that Hannah Lee is saying, yep, I just have to do it. Come, uh, no way around this. Then I would say you need to make sure that when you eat, you are eating the most nutrient-dense foods you can put in your dainty mouth. Don't waste time on on empty nutrients or empty or, or, or low calorie. If you already struggle with maintaining weight, one, I would say heavily scrutinize how long you need to fast because I I think that is important but when you do eat pick the most nutrient dense foods and ensure that you're getting an abundance of natural fats and proteins because the combination of those is going to help the body maintain mass just fat alone won't maintain mass that well just protein alone won't but protein and fat together both essential um, make sure you focus on those and then the least refined um, starches, you know, whatever the best fruits and vegetables are. And of course, Dr. Gundry's talked amply, abundantly about that um, it, it, out in, in the context that I don't. But 
focus on the protein and the fat because that's literally what you're made of and that's the the mass that you want to keep yeah that's a that's a great uh, answer i i see people who are often so successful on my program that they literally want to stop losing weight and uh what i do is my my favorite go-to is to have them eat a lot of macadamia nuts uh, and they uh, they're in my humble opinion and certainly i've, I've done the experiment on myself um, nuts uh, an overconsumption of nuts particularly macadamia nuts is a really good way to add i think healthy weight mm -hmm. on, onto people uh, the other thing that can work but i think you and i would both agree Starches do have a place in weight gain, uh, but you got to be really careful because there's a very slippery slope in starches beginning to pop up insulin. Well and said. I, I see it all the time. I know my, my friend uh, Dale Bredesen, because of insulin resistance of the brain, is now very skeptical that even, quote, good starches like a sweet potato uh, probably in his program has no place uh, in an Alzheimer's prevention program. Because you're right, we all agree that so much of Alzheimer's is driven by insulin resistance and, and high insulin levels. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, just going on a, you know, a, a, a healthy organic carbohydrate diet to gain weight uh, Boy, I see it in the blood work and I go, oh, no, you know, this is not what we're yep. looking for. So. Yeah. Well, all the more reason to if, if, if in particular with Hannah Lee, if she's determined to fast, um, you, you don't want to be spiking your insulin right after a fast. That's just not a great way to do it. Uh, and so I strongly recommend anyone who fasts frequently start with the protein and the fat and then let the starches, whatever form they may take, let them come after, let the nutrients get in and get nourished throughout the body. And then when insulin comes up a little later, then it will feed fat cells. Make sure that everything else has been fed first to a degree because the moment the insulin spikes, the fat cells are going to start taking a lot of it. And that might be the last tissue you want to feed. This next one is sure to surprise you. Interestingly, most people who think they're lactose intolerant are actually intolerant to casein A1 proteins. 